speaker of the hour is Hank Lawrence. Hank is a native of South Central Missouri and has preached uh, for six years at the Curry Street Church of Christ in West Plains. Uh, he, is, uh, he has served full-time ministry in both Arkansas and Missouri and has been guest speaker in several states. Hank is a former instructor for the Online Academy of Biblical Studies and the author of the book, Atheism and Abortion, The Perfect Marriage. He and his wife, Taylor, have two daughters, Emma and Ella. Brother Hank. Good morning, everyone. Once again, it's an honor and privilege to be with you today. And I think one of the things that, as a speaker, this lectureship does is it always causes you to look back at your lessons and try to continually be better. It's like the stakes are raised. And so I, I love the challenge and opportunity to be around such great men presenting these lessons and for the congregation to put this on every year. It's a highlight of the year to see each and every one of you. So certainly want to thank you all for this effort and this work and know that it is so far reaching the effects of it. So we appreciate the work you do and we, we do pray that you continue to do that. And, and it's an honor to be a part of such a wonderful event. We're going to look at this morning in Luke chapter 2 and verse number 52. The title of the lesson is Jesus' Example of Godly Growth. And I want you to go ahead and be opening up your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 and verse number 52. And while you're turning over there, I want you to, once you get there, pay attention to the picture on the screen. Now, one of the most interesting types of birds has to be what's called the cowbird. I don't know if you've ever heard of a cowbird, if you've ever seen one. They're, really, they're not really very significant to look at or anything like that. They kind of look like a little black bird with a little brown head. But one of the reasons that they're so significant and special is in how they raise their young, or rather a lack of how they raise their young. They're what's called a brood parasite. And the cowbird is probably the best known example of what a brood parasite is. Now there's a lot of different organisms that are brood parasites. You have them in insects, you have them in birds, you have them in fish. And what this means is that they rely on others to raise their young. That is the example of what a cowbird does. And so in birds, what the cowbird will typically do is they will go and lay its eggs in a host's nest and then it will allow the host to do the raising of its own children. Now the cowbird is interesting because it's not really the species. Now there are species, and you've probably seen them, that become very aggressive whenever they're young and pushing the other little birds out. The cowbird doesn't really do that, although there's some examples where it does. But one of the main things that it will do is it will use the resources, the nutrients, basically all of the attention of the host bird in order to raise up its youth. And now, one of the things that cowbird usually does to the detriment of the other nest mates that it has is it grows a lot faster and it gets bigger a lot quicker. And so the attention and all the nutrients and all of the food go directly for it. And so it actually outcompetes those that are there for resources. Now, you think about the cowbird, and I think about while we find it in nature, we find it in insects and birds and fish, a lot of different species that do this. It's unfortunate that we definitely have a lot of cowbirds in the world today when it comes to human parents. There are a lot of people today who drop off their children for someone else to raise. And they drop them off and say, well, it's your responsibility to raise them. And they drop them off and I don't necessarily know if it's a place or a person. And they expect that place or that person to raise them up and, and to nurture them while they themselves are absent. We have a lot of cowbirds in this world today. And I think we cannot be surprised at the declining number of faithful youth whenever we consider this example and whenever we look at the amount of parents that exist in our world today that will simply pass off their young people to be raised by something else or someone else. We have to be very careful that we are raising them up with a godly example in our mind, doing so in the way the scripture will tell us. And there is no topic, I believe, more important than the topic of this week's study, especially as we consider the subject of children and how well or perhaps how poorly we raise them up. And as we are considering the next generation that is coming up, and Brother Mornay last night in talking about how this generation's duty is in looking at the next generation and leaving them behind with something that they can look at. But in this generation where we say the world has gone completely mad, we can say, well, how exactly do we go about raising up the youth? How exactly do we go about raising them up with this godly example in mind? And one of the ways that we must avoid being is we must avoid being a cowbird. 
And so in Luke chapter 2 and verse number 52, there's four principles we're going to look at this morning that we're going to get from the text in Luke chapter 2 and verse number 52. Now this text is going to be interesting because this is going to be more of a transition text than anything. A lot of times it's looked over because you're looking at it and whether you're looking at the examples of Jesus' early life or what led to him, what led to his birth, and, and kind of all of those events and then looking past that, verse 52 is kind of a stepping stone from one portion of his life into the next. But it is so important for us that we read it and understand it. Luke 2.52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We're going to look at four principles this morning that come from that verse. I'm going to go ahead and give them to you so you have them and you're ready for them. The first principle is that principle of focus. The second principle is the principle of modeling. The third principle is the principle of relationship. And the fourth and final principle is the principle of process. And we can find each of those four principles given for us in this text this morning. And so let us consider the first principle, the principle of focus. If you read in your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4, we read, And ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now isn't it interesting that we are told what not to do in order to be effective, in this case, fathers. What not to do, and that is to not provoke them to wrath. Now, you think about this. How can we provoke our, provoke our children to wrath? There's a few different ways we can do that. Perhaps we ask unreasonable demands of them. Things that are simply not possible. How about we are too severe? Or even perhaps by our own anger rising up not controlled, and we pass off that anger to them. We're wrathful towards them. How about perhaps by not being consistent? How about by not nurturing them and so the child loses confidence in us? And so whenever you think about the focus of us as parents, we're told here what to avoid, but we're also told what to do. And so you'll notice here in Ephesians 6 and verse number 4, they should be brought up, they should be nurtured. That means being brought up, and it says in the training, in using discipline there, and the use of discipline and admonition, which also can talk about correction. So we are to bring them up appropriately, but not to provoke them to wrath. And we need to especially be careful that we're doing this when it comes to areas of spiritual and moral training. Whenever you and I think about what our focus is, Your focus as a parent is what? If you had to boil it down to one single focus of what your job is as a parent, what is your focus? Is it to raise holy children? Is it so that they might be faithful whenever they go and whenever they depart from the home? That is our goal and that is our focus in our mind in order to produce faithful children. And so in order to do that, we must be focused Do you think there was a direction for Christ in Luke 2 and verse 52 as he is increasing in wisdom and stature, as he is increasing in favor with God and man? Do you think that he wandered aimlessly without any focus of what the goal was in his mind? No, he was focused on what he must be, on what he must become. And so as parents, how can we walk around aimlessly and ever hope to produce a child that is godly if we don't have that focus in our mind? It will not happen by accident. It will not happen by us being a cowbird and passing it off, passing our children off to someone else to raise. My friends, we've got to be careful that we are focused. Paul bringing up this process in Ephesians 6 and verse number 4. If I know what my end goal is, and let's say my end goal is children that are faithful, I can make a game plan on how to reach that. But if I don't have that goal in mind, and I don't have that focus, and I don't have that target, I'm going to be wandering around without any purpose, without any direction. I'm going to be blown this way and that way. No, we've got to have our minds focused. And so the question is, what is our goal for our children? And what are we doing to obtain that goal? We're not going to get there by wandering around aimlessly. Another principle we find from Luke 2 and verse number 52 is the principle of modeling. Now in our text here, another text we can look at, if you turn your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 14 through 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 14 through 16. And Paul writes, I write 
not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have not met ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Now as you stop at the end of verse number 16, Paul is urging them. He is admonishing them. He's telling them, and this could be said, I urge you to imitate me. And you think about all of the different examples he is talking about that they have. And all of the different ways that they are being pulled. And if we are modeling ourselves after this person or that person, and let's say that their minds are not spiritually focused, we are inevitably going to become more like those people we spend our time with, aren't we? We are the combination, we are the, the fulfillment of all of those different people in our life that have influenced us. That's who you and I are. And so as we look at our children, Paul wasn't writing this, to shame them of their neglect or anything like that or their fellow laborers, he was warning them that they are not following Christ. That's the warning that he gives them back there in verse number 14. And he's telling them by not following Christ, you're going to make a shipwreck of your life. And it's going to be a tragedy. And so he is pleading with them. They have many teachers in Christ, he says. They have many teachers in Christ, but they have one father in the gospel. And so he says, being a faithful man... Being a man who's following after Christ, he is pleading with them for their own good so that they might imitate him in Christ. Remember, we talked about in focusing how it begins with a goal. And parenting begins with a target on the wall. It begins with us aiming for something and a child that our goal is for them to reflect the, the character of Jesus Christ as their target. We have a target we must aim for. We have a target, then we must pursue. Now, whenever you think about this, we ask the question, and this is an important question for all of us to consider, who exactly is doing the, the teaching of our children? Are we doing the teaching of our children or are we let, letting somebody else? Is it us or is it the world? Because regardless of who is doing the teaching, somebody is teaching them. And they are absorbing information from someone, from some place, there is an inevitable result of modeling. And that is the simple reality is your kids will become like you. Now, if that is the case, what does that mean in your family? What does that mean in your family? Now, don't get me wrong. You don't have to be perfect to raise faithful children. But they will be like you. And so as they are like you, is that something that you would be proud to say that they're like me? Or is that something where we need to look at the target again? And so the thing that I encourage us all to do is we understand this principle of modeling and this principle of this idea that children are going to grow up and be like us, whether we like it or not. They're going to take things away from us and the things we say and the things we do. And so let us come up with a clear-cut objective. If, that's, if we know that's the case and we know that they will be like us, then what am I like? Well, we must then practice what we preach. How can we tell them to do one thing? And then they observe us doing the complete opposite. There's an old saying, do as I say, not as I do. Does that rule apply to parenting? <laughs> no, that's the worst advice you can give. Because actions do speak louder than words. And so as a parent, knowing that they will be like us, knowing that they will turn out because of the actions and the words they have seen me do, what exactly then am I doing? In Matthew 23 and verse number 3, Jesus there in his confrontation of the Pharisees, that's what he called them out. He called them out because they were telling the people to do one thing and they had no concern for following it with their own life. He tells them, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. You know, the Pharisee mentality is the picture of a hypocrite. And as a picture of a hypocrite is seen, do we have that picture as a parent of perhaps being a hypocrite where we're telling them to do one thing, but in the end we're doing something totally different? Whenever we look back at the growth of Jesus and you see the principle of modeling, as he is increasing in wisdom and stature, he's becoming more and more like his heavenly Father. There was a goal in mind that he was seeking after, and there is a goal in mind that we as parents must seek after. The next principle we consider is the principle of relationship. 
Now, turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 7 and 8. Parents, we must build relationships that bond. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8 says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, you were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Now keep reading verse 11 and 12, that same book and chapter. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as the Father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now as you consider these words, kids have to know two things as they are growing up. Now not just two things, but they do have to know these two things. Number one, that they are significant. That means that their life matters. Their soul matters. And they must also know that they are secure. As you think about a child, one of the beautiful aspects of a mother, a mother so often builds up that security by that love and that affirmation that she carries for her children. But fathers also have to do their own job as well. And making sure there are boundaries that are there so they know that they're safe. So that they know that they're significant, that they are secure. The stronger our relationship is with our children, the more they will embrace what we practice and preach. Now, whether or not that's a good or bad thing is up to us. But we get to pick. Do we have that relationship with them? And the strength of that relationship, it'll determine, and conversely, the weakness of our relationship will very much likely be the cause of how they turn out to be one day. And so whenever we build the relationship with our children, tensions, tests, and difficulties, these things are all normal. These things are all part of growing up. And whether you're on the side of a child or the parent, or whatever you might be, even as a grandparent in teaching those coming up these principles, we've got to make sure we have that relationship. I read that there are eight keys to building a relationship, especially when it comes to children. And these eight things are this, to communicate love. To let them know that they're loved. To schedule time with them. To not be so busy that we forget about our job and goal with them. And then in looking at that time, to spend time that has focused attention on them. And then consider one of the most meaningful things we can do is give them eye contact. All of these things are just talking about giving them the time of day. To not pass them off off to somebody else. The fifth is meaningful embraces. To show them love, to show them affection. Ongoing communication. Having fun together. And then how about praying together? The eight keys to building a relationship with children. And I look at this, and obviously with all of the things you have learned this week, but look at this as a parent and say, Of the things I'm doing well, what am I not doing well at? What am I struggling with? What are the things that I could work on to be better at? Pick one of those things and do that this week. Pick one of those things and work on that this week. As parents, you know, a lot of times we're expected to have all the answers. In reality, we don't, do we? But we do have the guidebook. And we do have a way to show children that we do love them. There's a principle of relationship there that we have to have and we have to show affection to them. And then how about the principle of process? As you consider 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9, parenting requires ongoing maintenance and repair work, doesn't it? Just like you better change your oil every three or 5,000 miles in your car, you better do some tune-ups on your own life as a parent. Isn't that right, parents? I'm, I'm the one. And... Y'all just are caught in the crosshair. This lesson is for me, so I hope you get something from it. But as parents, we must make sure we're working on ourselves. This is a journey. Nobody has it all together. 1 John 1, 9, of course, says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I want to ask us this question. Do we carry this attitude in our Christian walk, or how about do we carry this attitude in dealing with our children in the home? Do we have that same attitude towards them? Do they have the same sense of forgiveness and willingness of repentance that John speaks of here in our home as we enjoy as Christians? 
Too often we might feel like you're a failure, but you consider these words, there's always room to improve. There are two phrases that can absolutely change your home, and those two phrases are this. Number one, I'm sorry. And number two, forgive me. Parents, never be afraid to say those two phrases. Because we are not always going to be right, and it's never too late to make that change now. To make that change of who we ought to be. Now, we say all of these things, and we study all of these things to get to this. Whenever we brought up the cowbird mentality at the beginning of the lesson, and whenever we think about what our job is, whenever you have all of these principles as parents that we need to be aware of and we need to follow, my friends, we have to recognize that duty falls on us as parents to do these things. I want you to open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 1. And something that we have seen, and I'm going to throw something out there, and you, you consider it in your mind if you think it is also true, have many replace the job of the home to raise faithful children with positions such as youth ministers and youth and family ministers? Have we replaced the duty of parents with somebody else just like a cowbird does? My friends, this office is something that is foreign to Jesus, to Peter, to Paul, to Titus or Timothy. Matter of fact, if you do a little bit of digging, you'll find that this concept was borrowed in the mid to late 1800s, and it was borrowed from denominations. And whenever you see this concept come up, there, there's a reason this position is given, and I've heard a lot, is, is given this age-old line, well, the church is losing its young people. We need them. But if you turn over there to Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, friends, do we not recognize the church doesn't have any young people in that way? The church did not bring them into the world. And friends, you realize that the church is not charged with rearing them? Do you know who is charged with rearing them, if not parents? Genesis chapter 1, 27 and 28, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. The design of God from the very beginning was that parents do the job of rearing their children and training them up. In Titus chapter 2 and verse number 2, we read that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and patience. In verses 4 and 5 of Titus 2, you read that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. My friends, I'm going to say this. And sadly, it's a controversial thing to say, but we don't need a village to raise children. We need parents to. We need parents to raise children. That's the design that God had. Whenever God told fathers to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, He was talking to fathers. That's who He was talking about. And so from, from Acts 2 through Revelation 22, you will search in vain for the duty or responsibility of anybody else to raise children other than parents. You will not find it. In Jesus' example of godly growth, you do not see him being raised up by village or by outsiders or by strangers. You find that there are parents there in his life that loved him, that cared enough for him, that they told him the truth. And that is where you see the fourfold development of a child here in Luke 2, verse number 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He increased with this mental capacity and wisdom. He increased physically in his stature. He increased in his spiritual abilities in favor with God and then socially in favor with man. And this is a journey of his progression in order to be prepared. In this verse, it prioritizes a child's development. Does this start way after that child is already in the home and perhaps left? No, friends, this begins at birth. And it begins on a journey that is formidable, so especially in their early years. And you all know as well as I do, kids are sponges. They're going to soak up those things that they are around. Well, what are they soaking up if we're not present? What are they getting taught if we're not present? Friends, they're getting taught from the world. 
And as Jesus' progression is seen here, it continues to go to this physical growth and then to spiritual development. And finally, you see it in his social relations. He's able and capable of dealing with people. Friends, this formula is for parents to rear children, not a village and not the church. And I don't mean that in saying the church has no responsibility to its young people. Don't misunderstand me. But parents have a direct responsibility to rear and raise up their children. I say this because too often we as parents, and I'll say I'm as guilty about it as anybody perhaps is, it is so very easy to be distracted by the physical, the social, the mental, and to neglect the spiritual. We might see them growing up, and I've known it. I saw it in my life growing up. I see it now with, with my young children. But we see parents, they shuffle their kids off to athletics as soon as they can toss a ball. And that, that's fine. But they emphasize popularity among their peers, and they go about and then hand them over to an individual to to give them more or less propaganda without ever telling them the difference. My friends, we cannot pass our children off to to strangers and expect to teach them if that is who who is doing the teaching as the stranger. And then sadly, if there is any spiritual development, so many parents will hand their kids off to a youth minister. They'll say, well, that's his job. That's what he's supposed to do is raise them up. Nope, nope, that's not the case. My friends, the church owes young people the same thing it owes everyone else in this world, and that is to preach the unadulterated gospel of Christ. That is the job. In Romans 1, verse 16 and 17, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The church is not the home, and the home is not the church. Both of those places are divinely established institutions with divinely established functions, both in their own spheres. We must make sure we are taking very special care and attention to what we are doing in our homes. Neither one of those may usurp the function of the others, but the church does so when it says that it is its job and not the parent's job to raise and rear up children. My friends, we must leave it to the parents. Go to Genesis chapter 18 and verse number 19. Genesis chapter 18, verse number 19. And we're going to finish with this passage. Genesis 18, verse 19, we read, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. You know, think about that in verse number 19. He knew that they would command their children, their household after him, and because he knew that, he knew that they would be able to, to keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, and that they may be able to get all those promises that were made back in the days of Abraham. My friends, children need homes where the word of God is revered and Christ is honored. They need homes where mom and dad are proud to be Christians and do not cower whenever the rubber meets the road and they're questioned on why they believe what they do. We need a home that will raise up children by God's design. As Luke 2.52 tells us, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Let us raise up children God's way. The way Jesus grew, let us raise them up to be prepared to face this world, to face the challenges that might be in it, and then be able to go on and be ready to ultimately one day hopefully have that home in heaven. Is that our target that's on our wall? And if it's not, let's get it up there. Appreciate your time, friends. Thank you for this. As all of us continue to look at our life, let's continually look at ourselves and be able to tune ourselves up. Thank you all.